Good evening and welcome to St. Jerome's University. My name is Peter Meehan and I'm your president and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you here for our next lecture in Catholic experience. Before we get going with our program, I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect that St. Jerome's University and the University of Waterloo reside and operate on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Our university is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land that Frederick Haldeman granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River in 1784. That includes 10 kilometers on both sides of the Grand River and extends from its source to Lake Erie. We give thanks for the privilege to work and live on this land, and we are committed to building respectful relationships with Indigenous people and communities to enhance our knowledge and to learn how we can have an active role in reconciliation. A little um, statement about the lectures in Catholic experience. Since 1982, St. Jerome's University has offered lectures in Catholic experience to our local community, providing opportunities for us to engage with the critical issues of our times. We've invited scholars, activists, experts, and religious leaders to address subjects including the religion and politics, spirituality, ecological responsibility, religious pluralism, ecumenism, interfaith dialogue, religion, and the media, among others. This year's theme for the lectures, Legacies and Lessons, confronts themes including the increasing gap between rich and poor, the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion, sustainability and its implications for the very future of our planet, and justice for and reconciliation with Indigenous people. Our hope is that the program of speakers we've engaged this year will allow us to explore, challenge, and walk our own synodal path to see the importance of encounter and dialogue and to understand the need for changes in both the church and the world that will be meaningful and lasting. At this time, I'd like to introduce St. Jerome's Vice President, Academic and Dean, Carol Ann McGregor, to introduce our keynote speaker. Good evening. Before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I just want to do a couple of items of housekeeping. The first of which is, and those of you who've been to a Lectures in Catholic Experience uh, will know this well, we don't normally have any AV issues, but we're getting a little feedback tonight. So thank you for your patience. If we do get um, some feedback, our, our folks uh, in the back are working to adjust it as we talk and as our speaker will talk tonight. Uh, as is customary at the Lectures in Catholic Experience, uh, we will have time for question and answer after our speaker's presentation. Um, if you haven't been here before, we invite folks to go to the podium mics in each of the aisles. Um, and the reason that we ask you to go to the mic to ask a question is that we have a, an audience tonight live streaming um, and folks who will watch the video later. And it's much easier for them to hear your questions um, if you go to the mic and ask them. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Dr. Bruce has done her lecture and we've had the Q&A, um, Peter will come back and say a few final words to close us out. With that, I'm uh, delighted now to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend and fellow sociologist of religion, Dr. Trisha Bruce, uh, as our speaker this evening. Um, I was telling folks at the dinner that we just had, um, I've known Trisha since I was a graduate student. We both attended a, an event called Young Scholars in the Sociology of Religion. It was at the invitation of Dr. Christian Smith, a really noted sociologist of religion at the University of Notre Dame. And his vision was to bring together a group of younger scholars who would be the future of the subfield, um, representing many different institutions. Um, his sense was that the future of the field would be charted by the people in that room. And it's been such a joy since then to watch how Trisha has fully realized that potential. Um, something that's been recently reflected in her being elected as the president of one of our major professional associations, the Associ Association for the Sociology of Religion. 
Uh, Trish is one of those rare folks who's respected inside and outside of the academy. Um, she's really rare among academics for being able to speak to distinctive audiences. So she's an intellectually rigorous scholar, capable of executing large qualitative and quantitative studies, never losing sight of important theoretical questions. Uh, but she's also a person very capable of communicating the significance of that research and scholarship to broad audiences, sometimes writing for the general public and sometimes as an expert trusted by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I won't list her full CV tonight, but I want to share a few highlights. Her first book with Oxford University Press focused on Voice of the Faithful, a contemporary movement seeking to change the church. I think there are some copies in the back for anyone interested. She's also written a book on different forms of parish life, including personal parishes. Um, and she has a forthcoming book on University of California Press on how Americans understand abortion. She's particularly attentive to understand polarization in the US Catholic Church and approaching polarization as an active listener and as a sociologist, something that she spoke of recently in a uh, National Catholic Reporter article. Um, that article was highlighting her newest role as one of six new expert consultants to the Synod on Synodality. So she'll be in Rome um, acting as a sociologist uh, uh, in that capacity. She also serves as director of the Springtide Research Institute, and we were lucky to host her this morning. So this is her second talk today. Um, this morning she wore her hat as director of the Springtide Research Institute to talk about Gen Z religion and spirituality. Tonight, for this Lectures in Catholic Experience, we're really grateful to have her with us to share some of her research on women in the church. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Tricia Bruce. so much for the warm, well, the cold welcome outside, but the warm welcome inside. It is truly a joy to be here. Still my clock. There are so many ways to enter this conversation. It's not a new conversation. Uh, one of the ways that I enter this conversation is as a marathon runner. <laughs> Uh, this is actually a half marathon that I just uh, ran in Asheville this last weekend. And in reflecting on gender and Catholicism, this is absolutely a marathon. Uh, this is a conversation that doesn't start or end today. And many of us, uh, quite honestly, might have some exhaustion <laughs> from thinking through uh, and talking through and sorting through and experiencing the question of gender and Catholicism in a contemporary sense and a historical one. I enter then with this curiosity and drive and quest and sweat and tiredness. I enter too as a sociologist. I am not a theologian. Uh, I am not a priest. Um, I am someone who comes with questions to try to sort through and figure out experiences and perspectives as they are. Uh, sociologists, of course, sometimes bear the reputation of uh, bringing bad news um, because we tell the truth uh, with a small t. Um, so sharing empirical truths is not always good news, and that is especially true in the context of the Catholic Church and sometimes the mismatch of experiences and expectations in light of um, what might be or what might be hoped for. Um, so I do bring that lens as a sociologist um, and recognize the limitations, too, of that lens as a sociologist, thinking through experiences, perspectives. There's another lens that I bring to the conversation tonight, and perhaps it's one that some in this room might recall or share for themselves. Um, that is me. Um, not, it's not a current pick, um, <laughs> although this is actually how my parents still see me. Um, <laughs> this is me uh, getting my first communion, um, and I was the child of, and still am, uh, the child of a, a wonderful set of parents, including a dad um, who was in the army. So we moved around quite a bit in my childhood, and I think that this is one of the reasons why I became a sociologist. Um, but we came back 
to the United States after living a number of places, including what was then West Germany. Uh, and it was after coming back from West Germany that we came back to my family's home parish in San Antonio, Texas, St. Matthew's, um, where I had my first communion, um, as well as so many other memories and uh, being in, in the choir and confirmation and the like. I, I think about this picture and what it evokes for so many young people in the church and so many people in the church of all ages who look back and reflect and think about their pathways in the church, particularly those who have served the church in various ways. Um, what did that look like? What from that vantage point did they imagine might be possible um, with the heart of service for the church? What does something like a vocation look like, whether or not it's tied to the formal parameters of an institution? Tonight, I want to share a number of things about that and about those visions and dreams and hopes and realities as they play out for little girls and little boys um, that I've spoken to, but not as little boys and little girls, um, that I've spoken to as adults who now reflect back uh, on where they are and where they've been and what it means for themselves and for the church as a whole. I do this tonight with the vantage point of one, two, three, starting with one. Okay, one time frame. I appreciated uh, earlier um, hearing Peter uh, St. Jerome's president uh, refer to his vantage point as a historian being grounded in, yes, long ago history. I'm gonna zoom us in a little bit closer. Um, although it's actually been, as they say in the South where I live now, it's been a minute um, <laughs> since Vatican II. Uh, it's been almost 60 years, but we'll call that still contemporary, right? <laughs> we'll call that within the, the scope of a lifetime. So one, one time frame, one time zone. However, again, approaching this as a sociologist, much of what I'm looking at here is a retrospective on that timeline. So reflecting back, and of course, depending on the, um, the age of folks, they're gonna occupy different pieces of that story, different memories of that story. Two stories, her story and his story. Uh, bringing those two pieces together in conversation to see and understand how perspectives and experiences and vantage points differ through that lens and filter and uh, uh, compare and contrast of, of gender and three studies. I, as a sociologist, have had the honor of doing so many um, different kinds of studies that have really opened up the space to be able to hear um, accounts, uh, oftentimes through the context of in-depth interviewing and the, the confidential space that that provides. That's the kind of work that I'm going to rely on more so tonight, more so than the numbers and quantitative work. And there are three studies in particular that I'm pulling from. Uh, the first is a, the National Study of the Catholic Priesthood um, that, uh, for which I led the qualitative portion uh, in, uh, in 2021. Uh, and reports from that came out in 2022 and 2023, uh, and additional work is, is happening and forthcoming. This included 104 interviews, in-depth interviews, with priests in the United States, both diocesan and religious. It was a subsample of a larger survey of priests that was done by Gallup of 10,000 priests. Um, and then from there, we subsampled, and my team interviewed 100 104 priests. Uh, the second and third studies are two um, separate but very overlapping studies of women, so collectively 96 interviews with women. One of the studies has primarily women who are more what we would call age-wise generationally Vatican II guard. Um, I will tell you more about those women as I get into a story about their particular connections in a moment. 
Um, and then the third study is a group of uh, a wider age range of 40 women whose service to the church looks diaconal in nature and function, meaning the kind of work that they're doing uh, might parallel something that a deacon would do apart from um, the absence of their um, ability to, to be ordained or enter that um, ordination role. So I'm pulling from these, um, this subset of what constitutes a little over 200 interviews, and I'm putting them together in this story, this generational story, this happy story, this sad story, this real story. And starting then from those early days, I also want to bring, I want to bring you into the story too, and maybe even prompt you in your own mind to think too. I showed you my picture of when I was in, uh, at receiving my first communion. What was your upbringing like for you? How do you describe the world in which you learned and were socialized into religion, faith, your identity, and your role therein? I'll bring in a few voices here. Listening to priests, asking 104 priests this question, and nearly 100 women this question, there are actually quite a few similarities, as you can imagine, hearing his story, her story, uh, in terms of the immersion in the faith. Uh, looking at her story, this is a woman who uh, grew up in uh, uh, a pre, she was born just pre-Vatican II, very much immersed in a Catholic world. Just so many memories of our little Catholic childhoods that kind of predominated pre-Vatican II, mass every day. It was powerful. Another woman shares um, about how they would plan their family vacations around being able to access mass. Um, and so, of course, it was a constant calculation of, well, we need to make sure that we are not too far away uh, from church on Sunday uh, because we're orienting our, uh, our experience around our ability to go to Mass. Some of you might have, have memories uh, similar. Um, many women talk to me about their um, very earliest memories coming from being in the pews um, on a kneeler, in this case coloring, uh, and that being extremely formative to, to who they are. He, listening to priests, a lot of similarities here too. Um, the, the couple I pulled also um, point to the increasing uh, diversity among priests that we um, are seeing now in the landscape, uh, particularly with regard to international priests. Here are two examples of priests who, in the first case, um, grew up, this priest grew up in Vietnam, did not have that similar immersion in the Catholic Church, uh, but got to know the church through missionaries and through people he met. And then a second priest talking about his particular experience in an orphanage in Mexico and how he was so formed by the priests that he got to know and very early on was asked, are you thinking about being a priest? Women talk quite a bit about families, Catholic families, men too, but also this, this pivotal role in the, the formation of relationships with priests who are in the church and, and serving and that kind of access to these, these um, trusted relationships with those who were in key um, service to the church. Uh, another woman called herself, she says, I describe myself as a pew rat. I hadn't heard that one. Though. So the, my earliest days, very much in, in the pews, quite a bit. Thinking, too, about the experiences of mass as a kid, and actually mass in, different, um, in a couple different ways. I wonder how many of you might have played mass I don't know if anyone ever played Mass. I played Mass. <laughs> yes, this comes up for both men and women, uh, the priests and the women that are um, describing their upbringing. So here um, is a priest talking about, uh, yes, I played Mass with my little brothers. 
Um, he talked about actually stealing cookies, um, marionitos, um, and coke from the kitchen, and then taking that to the garden and performing mass. <laughs> Likewise, I'll pull up her story on this side. Um, in this case, she acknowledges, she says, I learned by the age of seven, I couldn't be a priest. So this was an early recognition. But I got to play one. I got to pretend to be one. So her choice was not the Marinotto's uh, cookies, but the Wonder Bread. <laughs> if, you smash, if you smash one, it turns out pretty close. <laughs> do, do the yogurt. We can ask the priests in the room whether or not that's the case. Um, another piece that comes up here is serving as an altar server. And I wonder how many, if any, in the room served as altar servers. Uh, we know, of course, some of this has uh, connotations, too, with more recent changes in terms of the formal allowance of girls, in particular, to have access and the freedom to participate as altar servers, um, which even so has, has exceptions uh, by way of, of uh, both bishop and priest. Um, priests, in talking about their childhood, altar serving comes up quite a bit. Um, and this sort of this again this, this access this opportunity to participate in the in the liturgy in this meaningful way, um, the idea of role models and relationships again comes up quite a bit. For girls, again, depending on the age, um, for for many altar servers doesn't come up at all. Um, and, but for some, particularly some of the younger women, uh, do talk about altar, the opportunity for altar serving. And in this case, she's talking about, I actually, um, while I was doing it, I knew all, I knew the entire mass by heart, and I would say the words with the priest. And she says here, I don't know if anyone ever saw me ever doing that. No one corrected me. But she was actively participating in the church. So this deep immersion and part of what this points to, too, is the um, acceptance and sense of belonging or sense of separation that young boys and young girls experience in the church. And it doesn't necessarily play out in ways that we might expect and it does in some. Um, so here, a priest talking about, and this was very common, this sense of, I felt like this is where I belonged. So whether it was as through altar serving or perhaps an experience in youth ministry, um, being around um, others in that capacity, it felt like it fit. It felt like a part of their identity. Priests will talk very much about the priesthood being very linked to identity. Um, and and this, uh, this innate sense that doesn't leave once it's felt. What we hear here is a woman sharing, in fact, she too felt very much like she belonged. She says here, I never had any sense that I did not belong here, and nobody ever told me really that I didn't belong there. Um, so this is one that varies a bit among women because certainly we just heard in the last example, realizing early on uh, for the young girl who knew, okay, this is, there are spaces where I belong, spaces where I don't, and navigating accordingly, but also this perhaps simultaneous um, or for some contrasting the feeling of, oh, this is exactly where and how I belong. The sense of call, of course, is deeply ingrained in our understanding of service to the church and the sense of being uh, brought into in a way that goes beyond one's own personal ambition by way of professional trajectory, um, but something that requires a deep discernment. We, we might anticipate and expect, and in fact, interviewing priests, um, a ready and full conversation around the feeling of a call that is often tied, again, to those relationships with other 
men in the church and other priests. So here we have an example of a, um, a priest talking about seeing a role model priest and feeling called to that. And really, as he says, I wanted to be like him when I grew up. So seeing on the altar this manifestation of the priest, and there was something, as he says, just something intuitive that I knew. I just, I just knew, and it was the same priest for 34 years. I wanted to be like him. He says when he was early enough even to express it is when he started saying he wanted to be a priest. Women, too, very much talk about a call and different forms of a call, for some quite explicit, for some more subtle, um, for some direct into a, into a particular role or service in the church, for others a sense of a call to their, their uh, particular roles as a mother and family member or more. Here, a woman very expressly talking about her call to be a deacon that she did not want to hold on to just for herself. She wanted to share. So she started reading everything she could. She was a staff member at a diocese and got all of the diaconate materials and prepared herself and wanted to share. So she says, I had a meeting with my priest. I told him that I might feel like I had a call to be a deacon, to feed a vision of who I thought I could be. Women also shared that sometimes they would try to go to the meetings afterwards um, announced in a mass at, at the end about, you know, there's a discernment conversation around thinking about um, religious life, thinking about uh, whether it was the, the priest or otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on the nature of the conversation, oftentimes the expectation was that, or the direct pitch was that this was an invitation for um, men in the church to participate in these conversations. And sometimes the women would uh, share examples of actually going to join those meetings afterwards. And then, um, and then you know, oftentimes being said, oh, I, this is not, this is actually not intended uh, a conversation intended for you. But there was a deep desire to discern, to discern a call. Um, other women shared things like, I have never discerned a call, um, at least not a call directly into something like the clergy or some kind of ordination capacity to the church because I don't want to have my heart broken. Um, here she shares, it's been really hard for me to feel the freedom to consider a call because in some ways it would break my heart. It's not something that's open to me. So how then does this play out, and how have these points of access um, been shaped through time and experience and change, especially with that layer of Vatican II as a timeline? To start to bring that into the conversation, many interviewees, of course, have direct and lived experiences of the changes of Vatican II, and the energy the innovation, the spirit, the confusion, the chaos of experiencing Vatican II. One priest shares how he was, he was 10 at the time, observing it was very much a, a, a big change in the church. And for him, he was so eager to serve. He wanted to be a priest. And he thought, surely everyone would want to do this. Surely everyone would want to be, become a priest because he was so eager to do so. Uh, but he says he was, he was the only one that, that uh, rose his hand, I guess, from the classroom. Um, and, uh, and next here we uh, hear from a woman who says, oh, yes, it was a, it was a very tumultuous time. And it was when she was in, in high school. Um, another, as another one put it, it was the whole winds of change. And I really felt that that was happening uh, it, so this is, you know, this this period of um, immense change and newness created a, a ripeness and a possibility for something that perhaps many had not um, experienced before. In a sense that something was changing, something was coming. What was it? And the messiness of it, and the experimentation of it. And we start to see this play out with one priest, by way of example, who shares. Um, that he himself, as he says, I am a product of the reforms. I was in the guitar group. <laughs> I was a part of the bad liturgical music 
of the late 60s, the early 70s, and I admit, you know, the current generations of sem seminarians, they'll demon us, demonize us, oh, what awful stuff you all did in the 70s and everything. Well, you know, it was the 70s, and it was the culture, and we did a lot of those things because we could. Um, and and uh, a woman here sharing, well, it was definitely very messy. I know people who embraced it, embraced it full force, and people suddenly felt free. So priests and nuns felt free. Free to experiment, free to try, free to change, free to move. And the sense of freedom and innovation extended to then to opportunities for women in a post-Vatican II era in ways that had not been experienced previously. And I want to share one of those innovations and experimentations that emerged from that opportunity to play, to innovate. This is St. Francis de Sales Seminary in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Not long after um, uh, Vatican II, there were some um, important changes at this seminary. And it actually spoke to a broader trend in looking at women's roles. Women's, women began entering spaces in the U.S. church previously closed to them, earning degrees alongside priests, appointed to new de facto pastor roles in the absence of residence priests. And something a sociologist at that time, who's now passed, Ruth Wallace, would call trailblazing. She wrote a book called They Called Her Pastor. This book was written in 1992. And she was trying to sort of track this trailblazing cohort of women who were suddenly entering these new roles that Vatican II opened up in exciting ways for them. She wrote at the time, it is my position that this slow but steady change in attitudes regarding women clergy and married clergy will, in the last analysis, portend well for the future of lay leadership in the church. She did add, though, she said, my prediction is, however, tempered by the awareness of the tendency to resist change, particularly on the part of those in positions of power. Back to the seminary. There was a sense in Milwaukee at the seminary and captured here by the rector at the time, who, was, who served as rector from 1965 to 1976. While our first concern remains the development of the best possible pastoral priest as teacher, sanctifier, and shepherd, we are also very much concerned about those who feel themselves called to exercise a measure of ministry apart from the priesthood. For them, there is and will ever be an increasing opportunity at St. Francis, the seminary. This was in 1971. So in 1972, St. Francis Seminary began admitting students other than seminarians preparing for ordination to the priesthood. It was among the first seminaries in the United States to open its door to lay students. And that happened in fall semester 1972. 10 non-seminarians were admitted, eight men, and to women. Now, I said I was going to say a little bit more about that group of women. Let me do that now. The group of the older group of women, um, so they continue to accept women into the seminary for a number of years. I'll tell that story as this unfolds. Um, but about a year and a half ago, um, I, and I recruited a grad student from Georgetown, um, flew into Milwaukee and gathered all of the alumni that we could find and identify from this program. So in many ways, it's a, it's a cap end to the work that Ruth Wallace, in writing They Call Her Pastor, wrote. She did this large study of trying to understand these women at that time, soon after Vatican II, entering these spaces. And so then going into the space to ask, well, what, what, what happened? How did it, how did it go? Um, what's the rest of the story? Um, it was a very meaningful opportunity to gather. I, and I will never be able to capture that on PowerPoint slides. Um, but these women 
in this space of sharing food, sharing meals, sharing stories, um, and then opening their, their hearts to us through focus groups and in-depth interviews um, to hear their accounts of this experience. So this included, it says, eight men and two women. So those first two women, of course, were, were also in this gathering. Some of the women, of course, have, have passed on, uh, but those who were still with us and could be with us there came. And they told us things like this about their experience. I remember someone using the word maverick at the time, going to the seminary. I never thought about it like that at all. I'm just doing this. Some of them got some weird reactions from their family. My brother thought I was really crazy. What are you doing that for? I got some pushback. My husband didn't want to spend the money, you know, anyway, but I didn't pay attention to that. I just sort of felt like this is what I'm supposed to do, and I did. And they entered seminary. I'm going to toggle a bit back and forth as we hear from these women to hear again and to understand the context and experience that men are bringing of seminary, including this one from an older priest, of course, who talks about a lot of times for older priests, seminary meant going when you were very young, so high school, right, minor seminary. Um, and um, as he puts it, well, thanks. Well, that is gone now. Thanks be to God. That was the system I went through. But really going in a pretty early development. So er early access um, for older generations of priests and, of course, um, uh, no access directly for, for women. Uh, and priests also reflecting on their seminary experiences, in some cases critically, saying uh, that the, there needed to be a different kind of curriculum, I find myself telling retreatants today that um, we have a God that you don't need to protect your children from. I don't know how we got there. Well, I sort of have an idea of how we got there, but that it doesn't want to, I don't want to stay there. Um, so sort of critical and mixed reactions to seminary experiences. Asking women about their experiences in seminary, we, at, at St. Francis Seminary in particular, um, really quite positive evaluations of seminary experiences. Um, and uh, this, in many ways, this sort of enlightened revelation of being in a place, not unlike what we heard uh, earlier about a place that felt like, ah, oh, this is where I belong. So things like, I loved the study. I loved the connectedness. There was a diverse group of individuals there. It was a thirst I couldn't find anywhere else. For many women, uh, they wanted to gain competence, perhaps in roles that they already occupied uh, in, in or with or alongside the church or religious education. And and it gave them this new confidence through competence to be able to have access to it um, and growing in a knowledge of Catholicism that had felt not accessible to them. Here one shares that she um, was especially intrigued by this course on mysticism. So she thought, okay, you know, I'll go check it out. Um, and it was life-changing for her. And she, she, as she describes it, drove up this long, beautiful driveway um, and, and went in and then felt something that she'd never felt before. She says, I was like, wow, this is wonderful. This is where I belong. It just, I didn't even have to think twice. This is where I belong. For many, it activated a dormant call of sorts. So that, that sense of, oh, I don't want to think about this. This is a sense of heartbreak. For here, women talked about ex this experience as being one that awakened and enlivened in them something that they hadn't really felt before. Here, one shares, um, what do you, the question was always, well, what are you being called to? Um, she, she was 56 when she started in the seminary, and she said, I knew I was supposed to show up, and I showed up. I'm doing what I was called to do. I was just like open and waiting. I was a blank slate, fill me up. And another shares, I was hungry to learn. I had been doing a lot of reading, but I really wanted to go further and learn more. Many of them are, have already served the church for years or decades, but this new opportunity, and again, this new, um, this new spirit of enthusiasm and possibility that was coming out of a, the fervor of Vatican II um, enlivened these, these possibilities that really um, that played out for, for many years. At the same time, of course, women didn't have a clear out outcome. 
So for men entering the seminary, the expectation or the, the hope or the discernment was a, a, a likely call to the priesthood. And for women, of course, it was sort of like, well, and I think this was part of the reactions that they got from family members, like, why are you going? And a lot of them didn't really have an answer to that. It's like, well, I, I just, I, I want to go. I feel like I belong. I feel caught, you know, this sort of excitement. But there's not like a clear, you know, if you're meeting with a career counselor, it's like, why are you going to seminary? Like, because you're going to get... What, what job or what position. But again, there was this, this newness and this openness. And in fact, many felt like, ah, oh, this is something I can, um, I can leverage in ways that, that allow me to serve the church in more meaningful ways. Um, in one case, uh, the bottom quote here, a woman went because she wanted to be a better reporter. So she was a, a reporter and she thought if I go, um, if I, she was writing for some of the Catholic newspapers um, and she still does actually, she's a wonderful writer. Uh, but she felt like going to the seminary was an opportunity then for him to, to get immersed um, in that world and understand it better. In 19, by 1976, lay students were 20% of the total student body at this particular seminary. 20%. Uh, in 1977, the Association of Theological Schools approved a new degree program at the seminary called a Master of Theological Studies. And the way that the women describe it, too, is that they were very much following the educational track of, of priests. So they were alongside, they were learning, they were in the same classes, they were getting the degree equivalency and experience and faith um, experience that was, was being offered to men who were pursuing the priesthood at that time. This is a time of burgeoning lay ministry, right? So lay ministry growing in the U.S. Um, in 1980, the Conference of Catholic Bishops issuing called and gifted, uh, the document lifting up uh, lay ecclesial ministry, ministers and especially the role of women. As you see here in this language, we welcome this gift uh, as a gift to a church. Special mi mention must be made of women who have in the past not always been allowed to take their proper role in the church's ministry. We see a need for an increased role and women very much felt that. Again, here, I grew up in the 60s, post-Vatican II. What got me to St. Francis Seminary was the women that I knew who were doing good things. They were doing good things in the 80s and 90s, and so that was a really good time to be a woman in ministry. And the experience of seminary together shaped both men and women um, in the seminary. So this, um, the, her story comes from the accounts of women. His story, this is a um, this is actually from a priest who was trained at that same seminary. Uh, so uh, the priest sharing, we were all trained with lay people, leaders. I really enjoyed the mix with lay people. There was predominantly women, but there were some men in the program as well. They mixed classes. It just prepared you for collaborative leadership, working with lay leaders. Um, and then he also hints, though, this priest, he says, some bishops wouldn't send their students there because the seminarians were with lay people. They wanted their seminarians to be trained in a seminary without lay people. So there's these sort of hints of, of resistance. Her story, again, very uh, this, this um, lauding the idea of classes together alongside seminarians, feeling equal, a lot of um, references to feeling like, ah, suddenly I'm I'm here, I'm present, I'm co-responsible, I'm co-equal, I'm this, this um, renewed sense of co-responsibility that they hadn't experienced before. Pope John Paul II mandated a visitation of seminaries in the United States in 1985. In 1985, three bishops then and two priests conduct a review of St. Francis Seminary. By 1990, lay students account for two-thirds of those pursuing graduate degrees at the seminary. So you see this sort of shift. And, and I say lay students, but um, this is uh, majority women students. So this is, this is very gendered also. Um, in this review, the report that comes out of this review indicated concern about the mixing of students together in classes and formation events, the effect of lay formation programs on priestly formation, and lay students being able to pursue the Master of Divinity degree. The report also noted that the percentage of lay students far exceeded guidelines of uh, 25 percent, which was recommended. Um, in 1985, by way of comparison, lay students comprised some 60 percent. 
So the, the energy that the women felt in attending this, uh, they, they shared and spread the news <laughs> and more came and more came and more came and the balance got to be about 60-40. And that suddenly started to change some things. As the women observed, you know, there weren't as many seminarians. And then over time that grew and that started to change dramatically. And that shifted the sense of welcome. As one says, initially we were very welcomed. We were part of the gang. We weren't looked at differently. And then suddenly that started to change. And, and remember that, that belonging, that language around belonging that came up before? Now we hear this. It didn't, it, it really did shift in terms of, you know, that sense of feeling. You didn't feel like in the beginning, you didn't feel like you were doing anything extraordinarily. And then later on it became, well, do I even belong? In 1991, in response to the declining number of priests and the increased need for qualified lay uh, ecclesial ministers, the seminary discontinued the MTS degree and replaced it with something called MAPS, the Master of Arts in Pastoral Studies degree. Some of the women that were gathered um, in this space to sort of talk through this experience, um, a smaller proportion of them had gotten the MAPS degree. And as this one puts it, I still kind of feel like a second-class citizen to you because I, I got the maps, you know? I don't have the same degree that the priest has. Um, the way they described it is that it no longer had that. It was like a, uh, I mean, a fluff degree may be too, uh, too strong to say it, but it felt like it didn't have that same sort of experience and immersion that was so exciting to the women who received the full degree. Fast forward, of course, to 2002, crisis of abuse in the church, and this huge moment of reevaluating the ways in which we are thinking about both seminaries and, um, and the priesthood and the clergy and the mixing of lay people and priests, and you start to hear these big differences. Uh, there are lots of differences, and I won't go into all of them here tonight, but there are many differences between priests who are ordained before 2002, uh, sort of the height of the crisis, we know the crisis actually preceded that, and of course the actual abuse preceded that by decades. Um, but the height of these revelations of abuse um, in 2002, those who were ordained before versus those who were ordained afterwards. Um, so before, talk of, I liked the lifestyle of the priest and recognition and respect that the priest had. I didn't see, I didn't have any idea as a seminarian as, or as a priest that there was such a thing as abuse. There was this sort of, um, uh, uh, the, the privilege of, of naivety in part, right? It was not part of the zeitgeist. After 2002, the complete opposite. So, so men entering seminaries and describing, feeling like their family would say, what are you doing? You're not one of those. Um, being inside seminary and being looked at and having to defend oneself or also carrying the weight and the burden of responsibility for a church that looked different and a priesthood that looked different and acted differently. Uh, as one says, in seminary, all of a sudden we were guilty before we were innocent. So massive changes happening in seminaries. Uh, meanwhile, women reacting to this uh, abuse crisis and speaking to the absence of, of women in the conversation and in the structures that facilitated what happened. Uh, so the grief that we're going through. Uh, and, and yet another reason, as she puts it, why some feel like they should leave. In 2006, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee closed the seminary to lay students. Which again, of course, that means to women. And interestingly too, if you look at the seminary's website, and this is something that the women commented on, um, it has no mention of the lay formation program in the history of the seminary. There are no lay ministers listed among notable alums. One woman uh, showed a picture in which she had literally been cut out of the ordination class because she had received a degree alongside, and she told the story of taking the picture and everything, um, and she's not in the picture. 
women then, of course, come out and are looking for these, these roles, these positions. And early on, because of that um, momentum and that energy around new roles in Vatican II, a lot of folks, including in the Archdiocese in Milwaukee, were being very creative and appointing things like pastoral ministers and giving women really clear and big roles. By the time that the, the seminary, oh, through the years, and by the time the seminary no longer welcomed um, this, this opportunity for women, those roles had largely gone away. Either they were not paid, uh, and so if women were trying to juggle obligations financially, it was not tenable for them to enter them, um, or they simply did not exist. Um, so some women talk about pursuing different things, of course, like um, many become, become chaplains, nursing, um, another possibility, but even that, of course, the tension here is, as one chaplain mentions, um, of, of who, who actually counts and constitutes a, a chaplain and the different definitions in and outside of the church. This gets paired then, so women uh, with high levels of education but unable to find ways to formally serve in the, ch in, in the church with stories of priests who are highly overwhelmed due to a priest shortage, so an inability to do the, priest, um, the work of a priest. So the, the amount of burnout that comes up in interviews with priests is really intense. Um, oftentimes they're driving hours and miles and miles to serve multiple parishes. They're trying to do administrative work on top of um, the liturgies and, and sacramental work that they do. It's overwhelming, and especially for young priests. So young priests today are very quickly elevated into very big roles, perhaps at a very big parish. Um, so very quickly stepping into these roles because they, there are not many priests. As one woman put it, it's generational. The people who were prepared in the 80s and the 90s were given a sort of free range. They really thought they had the power that priests had at that time, and then it was taken away. I should uh, notice, though, that this is not necessarily said in a... Um, a, a critical way of the experience. You know, there, there's a mix, there's quite a range of expressions and understandings of what men's and women's roles in the church should, should be, what they could be, um, including by both men and women. And part of it does circle back to notions of, of power, of access to authority, um, who, who should have it, what does that look like, and what is it okay to want? I asked both all of the women and all of the men, if you were to advise a young man, a young woman, along this path, what would you suggest? And I wonder too, you know, if you, as you've imagined your, uh, your own self as a young person, right? What, what might you advise to a young person if you were giving advice? We hear some contrasting stories here um, from priests, things like, essentially, if you want to be a priest, you won't find it anywhere else. This is, if you're called to that, you have to do that. This is it. This is the life for you. For women, something more like, you have to find it or create it elsewhere. So we hear things from men like, this is a powerful life. If God is calling, to, calling you um, to this, this is where your joy will be. If God is calling you to this life, this is where your joy will be. Where will you uh, will be open to engaging it is not as, as you want it. Um, and, and another saying, if you were called to this, it would be difficult for them not to be a priest. Women saying things like, I hate to say it, but I would say don't. Do something else. I feel a really good way to lose your faith is to try to pursue ministry in the Catholic Church as a woman. I think I've realized I would advise her that, you know, go follow God's call for sure. And it might not necessarily be in conjunction with the Catholic Church. It might be in parallel. I would tell her to just think long and hard on it, honestly. Decide if this is the fight you're in for. Is this the hill you plan on dying on? From men, a strong sense of, if you're going to do it, do it right. For women, do it anyway. 
men describing this heightened sense of the great life of the priesthood if you play the rules, if you love the Lord, if you love your people, if you're in it for other reasons, it's not going to go well for you. You need to be a good priest. You need, be, need to be a good holy priest. Um, young priests especially will say very much this kind of language, this sort of reclamation of trust in the church. You need to be a good priest. Do it right. Women oftentimes looking for alternatives and ways to creatively adapt to serve the church. We are one sharing. Discern placements where she will be well supported pastorally by whoever is going to be her supervisor, whoever is going to hire her to be her collaborator. Women would share stories about having to um, leave, leave parishes where if a new priest came in and was no longer open um, to her collaboration or co-responsibility in the parish, then it became an impossibility to share her gifts. Another sharing, find the way to become competent in your own chosen life. Find a way to become competent, right? Maybe the seminary is closed. A lot of um, women who serve the church are highly educated because education becomes a bridge and a tool and a point of access to entering the conversation, to having a place at the table. Men sharing things, advice like build humility and finding meaning in great joy. From women, advice like build confidence, find meaning in resilience. Priests will share things like sometimes men will enter the priesthood expecting or thinking they might be treated like superheroes and this idea of the pedestal. And of course, there's a transition to sort of pre-Vatican II, post-Vatican II and different understandings of the priesthood. But this idea like you might come in too puffed up, so you need to temper down. Um, but there's so much meaning. I, if you want to do this, I wouldn't want any other life. I can get him into the seminary because it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Uh, from women hear a, a deep sense of, yes, I, I feel like one of the luckiest people alive, but paired with that, right? It has been so full of joy, adventure, grief, sadness, depth of relationships, opportunities to refinement on gold, on fire, and men mentorship. Uh, he, this second one is a woman sharing with her daughter who's asking her, because her daughter knows that she wants to be a deacon, and her daughter, she's sharing with her daughter, well, I'm sure if God wants me to be a deacon, I'll be a deacon in heaven. Women also give advice to younger women to find support, find a circle of people who are going to support you and love you and push you on in your spiritual life. Find a core group of people when other people are trying to shove her down. So shoring up resilience as being a key part of advice shared. Keep faith, relationship with God, a key part of advice shared across both men and women. And recognition of suffering too, pre-sharing. You're going to suffer. You have to have that personal relationship with Christ. Don't try to escape it. Prayer is incredibly important work on growing. And for women, here she shares, my initial knee-jerk reaction is to say run, but that's a fear-based reaction. I would say have your heart and your prayer focused on God, kind of like the need to cultivate a very, really deep personal collective prayer life, saying yes to service. In this advice, what I hear from men is especially an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to lead with the recognition of an imperfect and broken church. And from women, oftentimes that service is couched too as a, a lament. There's a certain sadness there. And it's a generational sadness too, hearing from both young women and older women and older women who used to be younger women who sounded more like younger women do now, but now look back and reflect with a sense of sadness and lament, paired with hope.
the call might feel different and the service absolutely looks different. But I think putting them into conversation and seeing the ways in which we are in fact connected and that listening begins to expose and help us to understand the ways that these paths start so early and are unfinished from Vatican II to today, from the moment of our own First Communion, perhaps baptism or otherwise, um, and what our service looks like to the church. Thank you. I'd be happy to engage questions as well and thoughts and, and responses and reactions of your own. Um, thank you for your talk, Dr. Bruce. I really appreciated hearing your perspectives and from those uh, three studies. I'm curious from your last bit around um, asking priests about what advice they would give to young men. Um, did you also ask priests what advice they would give to young women? Like, was there yeah. a recognition of the yeah. difference of that? Yeah. So the, I love this question because the way that the question was asked of them was, what advice would you extend to a young person interested in the priesthood? And so for the vast majority, it was an immediate imagined gender assumption. So occasionally, like when I was doing the, the interviews, I would occasionally say things like, you know, a, a young man or, or a young woman. I would sort of slip in it like, you know, just because I was, you know, legitimately curious, but, but the default, um, I think, spoke also to the, the ways that, that that question gets imagined. So it largely played out the responses as an imagined same gender person. Oh. And oh my gosh, yeah. I was really struck by the Vatican, by the archdiocese in the United States, and the obstacles that were put yeah. before her. She yeah. was turned down over and over and over again because she was a woman. We haven't had a woman missionary mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. The other side to that, she was an Italian parent. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it really saddened me to see how many obstacles, and this is back in the late 1800s. Yeah. 1900s, how many obstacles are put before women mm -hmm. um, before and now? And it's just more of a statement than it is a question. Yeah. But are we still seeing that kind of yeah. thing today? Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate the example, too, because um, we heard so much how role models and examples of others are formative to the ways that young people talk about their entry into service to the church. So to the extent that there, there are or there aren't particular types of um, models or illustrations of what does it mean to live out one's faith like that. And then, yes, certainly the number of obstacles to, to naming and um, seeing and showcasing those kinds of role models are are uh, inhibitive, right, to the to the imagination. You know, a lot of the women um, would talk about bitch and the one who who had the conversation with their um, her daughter, but a lot of them would talk about their kids and especially their their daughters um, and the hardness around those conversations, paired with the hope of what kind of church they want for their daughter. Um, you know, men, of course, the, the priests, are, I'm not able to capture those same conversations. So I would actually be really curious. But they do talk about, um, you know, looking ahead to the future. You know, one thing that I didn't, I forgot to mention, um, priests as a profession are um, very happy. So priests are actually, it's one of the happiest, meaning like meaning-filled, joy, deep joy professions that there, there are, if you, they do studies of asking different folks in different professionals. And, and priests are, for 50 years, priests have been consistently high. So this deep sense of meaning. And so pairing that then, right, with this sort of hope and joy 
but also lament of women who serve in uh, functions um, of paralleling alongside. Um, then it, it's a it, it looks different. It looks different. Go for it. Okay. Thanks so much, Trisha. This was fascinating and a very moving talk. Um, I'd like to come back to the uh, idea of scarcity and kind of where you see this impacting the church in the next, say, 50 or 100 years. Do you think it'll get so bad in Western societies because there's like almost no renewal of uh, religious leaders in many cases within Western societies that it would push a change with the church's relationship with women and the roles that they see for women or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. And again, this is where I, I have my sociologist hat on and not, I don't have a theologian hat, so I don't even know, that won't fit my head. Um, and it's part of these questions, right, do you sort of butt up against, but you're asking a deeply sociological one with regard to scarcity and the structure of the church. Um, so while there is what some might call a, a priest shortage, um, uh, and certainly not enough priests who are able to. So there, there, there is already a responsiveness to that in terms of very creative arrangements, because canonically, a pastor needs to care for a a, a parish um, defined as a as a community of people, a territory, with the exception of personal parishes. Um, and so there are a lot of very creative arrangements now where a single person is responsible for lots of different communities, which as you can imagine, you kind of heard in that um, remarks from the men, how difficult that is. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that women are in a huge number of lay ministry roles. Like the vast majority of lay ministers are women. It's like 90% of, of lay ministers. So the work of the church is, is in fact being done um, by women. Um, but then it's a question of like, well, what can be done and what cannot be done? Because the limitations and, and women would talk about the hardship of not being able to meet people's deep needs in moments of, of crisis especially, or need that because of, of their lack of access of um, uh, the ability to do things like a, a, a baptism or offer a, a, a word um, where it might be needed or offer mass or the like. Um, and, uh, and so women are able to do some things but not others. So to the extent that there's an increasing need for that, and I think that that's what we're seeing in some many regions of the world, uh, but including in the U.S. where I uh, have done this work in particular, um, there's a lot of creativity happening right now, and that may continue to push um, the question of how to, yeah, what, what that means. But usually the church doesn't use sociological reasons. Um, they use theological reasons, so... Uh, oh, yes, thanks. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I was struck at the end of your talk that you had your chart there with the, um, well, literally advice columns, right, yes. from the men and the women. <laughs> and the, um, the last one where the, the men, was, it was, you know, to lead an imperfect or broken church and the women to uh, lament mm -hmm. an imperfect and broken church. That was uh, striking. What, I have a couple of questions related to that, though. And the first one is, to what extent do they, um, or did they um, uh, explain why the church was imperfect or broken? Like, did, was it connected? Were they seeing that in kind of a personal way through the, the formation they had had? Because they, here are people who've had, you know, uh, deep formation within yeah. the, 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 the church, and, and yet they see it as imperfect and broken, and that, that's striking to me, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to if they offered reasons as to why that was. And then my second question, then you can ask, or answer both if you could. Um, the, uh, the second question is then, well, there's a difference between imperfect and broken. An imperfect church is a church, well, it's, yeah, it's not perfect, but you know, it's, it's going to be okay, we'll keep going, it'll be fine. A broken church is something, well, it's broken. It has to be fixed. Uh, an imperfect church, I don't think there's that kind of impulse to say it has to be fixed. It has to be accepted or tolerated. So I'm wondering if they saw a distinction in, 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 in those, in between those two. Yeah. So if I yeah. leave those two questions with you. Yeah, yeah Thank no, you. I uh, appreciate the question. And it does conjure to the 
spectrum of responses to understanding the diagnosis, right? What is the diagnosis? And, and sometimes what would come up is, is things like, well, I understand that this is run by, by humans, right, who are, who are doing their best or people who are trying to make the decisions, but in fact, we, we, don't, we don't know. I mean, if, an example too would be when women are talking about a vocation and a call that they sense deeply for themselves, that then the, the church is responding to them that, they're, that that's not a call. So it becomes a sort of crisis of like cognitive dissonance at best or personal crisis at worst. And so, you know, I think part of the, the imperfect or broken is that it's either me or the church um, is, I think, I think part of where that comes from and the lament. Um, and then the, the difference between the imperfect and, and the, the broken, you know, um, women would make different choices too about their willingness and desire to stay and serve or not. So there um, are certainly examples of women in this cohort that I described from the seminary who had who made very different choices, including leaving the church, um, including joining other denominations. Um, one did become a, a woman priest um, through that, that organization. Um, so their evaluations differ, but many, most, stayed, um, and, and not all use the word broken. So I, I don't want to overemphasize that that was a consistent refrain. Um, so I think uh, for some, it was a sense of urgency for perhaps change, if not conversation around this deeply felt um, angst of a mismatch between what's happening with the desire to serve and the ability to, to serve. Thanks. I'm curious about the role of women in the convent and mm -hmm. whether nuns were something you considered including yeah. in your study or why they aren't in it. Oh, I love that. I would love to do a whole separate study of nuns. In terms of their actual inclusion, um, there were a handful of women who um, had previously served as religious sisters. Um, so we definitely had those. In terms of currently serving religious sisters, we did not have any. So it would be, yeah, it would be very helpful and interesting to do a, a, a supplement to the Her Story col column or a third story uh, column entirely. Yeah. You have to hurry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Dr. Bruce, uh, first of all, thank you for this, um, for this talk. Thank you for this morning as well and for opening up our eyes and helping us see and hear this story. So I appreciate that. I'm curious about the Synod. I'm curious about, you know, what questions or what, you know, longings of your own heart that you're going to bring to Pope Francis and the team and, and um, you know, how you're going to sort of share these stories and, and uh, you know, I guess the, the female diaconate, woman diaconate, is that coming on? I mean, certainly it's getting a lot of press right now. And you know, sure. where do you see the movement from a synodal perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have very much appreciated the Senate process because it activates some of what sociologists love to do, which is, you know, get people to tell their stories and share them with each other in spaces where it's safe to do so across lines of difference. Um, to me, that's the greatest hope that I have in this, um, and it's, a, it's an honor to be invited into that conversation. Um, I really don't think this is about me. <laughs> and so I think it's me holding in my head and carrying with me all of these, all of these priests, all of these, these women, um, all of the folks that I interviewed for all of the books over there and other reports that I've done. Um, and, and there's a, a huge array and diversity of experiences in that. Um, and that, that to me is the, the lens that I bring and the role um, that I see having uh, in this. And, and that's also kind of a, a luxury of saying, um, this is not mine to decide. Um, this is not mine to uh, discern on a global level of any sort. Um, what, my, what is mine is to make sure we hear each other and we understand what's happening and what's, what's experienced. And we can't, um, and I, I am an access point to lots of different perceptions and experiences. So my hope is that I can share that um, in ways that are, that are meaningful. Yes. 
Thank you for a really deep and thoughtful um, presentation. I'm, I'm really fascinated by that example you gave of the erasure of that history. Um, and you know, we so often we tell these progressive narratives of linear progress, especially on rights and equality, moving in a direction of increasing openness. And, and it's interesting that there's this concealment of greater openness in the past. And I'm wondering if you have other examples like that you, that you've discovered where there were more opportunities in the past and retrenchment and, uh, against that and, and then how that gets covered up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I think that this is a, an ongoing grappling to because one of the other places is in in response to the crisis of, of abuse and all of that that has um, disclosed and uncovered ways that need to change. Um, but the reactions to, to what the causes are of the crisis um, leads to different reactions of what the outcome and consequence should be. Um, which means sort of hiding or suppressing different things. So interviewing all these priests, of course, there's a, a huge array of, we ask questions around what are the roots of the crisis of abuse? Um, and, and it differs, and it also differs ideologically too. Um, and, uh, and, be, and, and playing that out um, in terms of, of uh, you know, what stories we tell, how we tell about why this happened and how it won't happen again, um, on those roads look, look different. <laughs> um, and younger priests, uh, by and large, are, are much more conservative than older priests. So priests, generations of priests don't really understand each other anymore. So the Vatican II priests that are wearing shorts to the barbecue are really confused by the young priests wearing the cassock. And they look at each other like they're like both aliens, and that they've both messed up the church. Um, and so it's uh, yeah, and so it's a it's a volley for like who gets to tell the story, and and that also means who gets to write the story for what comes next. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bruce. That was wonderful. Quick question for you, just with your social, social, your hat yes. that you wear so well. <laughs> um, you would think with this history that there wouldn't be so many women in the pews, yet there are more women, and especially yes. young mums mm -hmm. in the pew, more than men, mm -hmm. right? There's still mm -hmm. lots of men there, but there are more women in the church when you look around. Mm -hmm. Why is that after yeah. this history? Yeah. 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 I mean, those, this, that's the question that uh, women that I interviewed had to answer for themselves all the time, too, uh, because you're, you're absolutely right. You know, women are there. Um, and I think for some, it's a, it becomes an exercise in cognitive dissonance. Um, but I, don't, I also don't want to overplay that all women are... Um, frustrated and upset and lamenting. Um, there is, of course, a wide, I would say, an increasing array of mass attending women. And I say mass attending because if you look at Catholics' opinions on different things, including their agreement with church teaching, um, the more they go to mass, this is more so true than it used to be, the more likely they are to agree with church teaching. So there's also this sort of self-selection happening um, and then there's also, I don't want to throw this one in too, but there, there's also an issue of fertility, so fertility rates and also um, views on birth control. Um, so uh, women, you know, women who agree with church teachings are um, quite frankly doing a better job replicating themselves in the church um, <laughs> in terms of uh, both the birth control issue and the family. I mean, there are lots of like dynamics at play and some of these we'll, we'll see how it plays out over time. Um, you know, generationally, I think we have to pay attention because there are also a lot of people, older people, um, and here I'm speaking to sort of uh, Americans in general, knowing that context uh, best, who retained their religious affiliations despite disagreement or lack of activity. Younger Americans are much more ready to shed religious affiliations and religious identities because they don't have that same kind of tethering um, to the church. So I think that observation, uh, it's possible it could change. I, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. 
Um, but it's, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed group. Certainly today, there are absolutely men and women, a lot of women still very much in the church, very much paying attention to these issues. So we'll see what happens next. So I think it's safe to come up now. I think so. Please join me in thanking our guest, Dr. Tricia Bruce. Before we leave, uh, just a few thank yous and reminders. Thank you to all of you for being here and helping to live out our mission to be a place where thoughtful people think, hopefully, about the major issues facing the church and the world. We certainly got a good dose of that tonight. Thank you to Jamie Phillip and her team for supporting our events here at uh, St. Jerome's in Marketing and Communications. Thank you to our facilities team who set up tonight's space for those attending in person. For those attending virtually, thank you to our IT, IT team, including Shirag, uh, and our IT team here at St. Jerome's. And thanks as usual to Norm Clare from the Own Marketing Group for helping to facilitate a live stream for those unable to join us in person. A recording will be posted on our website and we welcome you to share this with folks that you know who may not have been able to attend the talk this evening. Thank you to our partners at Dana Hospitality for tonight's beverages and snacks. We encourage you to continue to enjoy those before you head home. And finally, we hope to see you back here at St. Jerome's for our final lecture in Catholic experience for the 23-24 uh, season on April 15th at 7.30 p.m., when our guest will be planetary scientist and director of the Vatican Observatory, Brother Guy Consolmagno. His talk, When Science Goes Wrong, The Desire and Search for Truth, takes on misunderstandings of the nature and history of science, on the understanding how science only brings us closer to truth by recognizing where and how it has gone wrong. Among the ideas Brother Guy will address will be his take on Galileo's revolution in science and what this can tell us as we grapple today with dark matter and dark energy and about the nature and the search for truth itself. We hope you can be with us. Have a safe drive home. Thank you.